The previous discussion focused on Java 8, largely emphasizing the differences between imperative and declarative paradigms. What I'm going to do now, and I'll hopefully get through a bunch of this stuff today, and if anything's left over, we'll get through it all on Monday for sure, is give you a little background on the object-oriented parts of Java, um, which are sort of what it's been known for for you know, the last n years. Java came out around 1995, so for <clears throat> nearly 20 years, it was an object-oriented programming language. And then in 2014 or so, it became a hybrid language. Um, the key thing is that the object-oriented part is still quite valuable. And I'll talk about that a little bit more when we talk in more detail about what Java 8 provides, especially with respect to concurrency. But the object-oriented parts are important, and they all play together nicely. So I'm going to go through this really fast. I suspect you know a lot of what I'm about to say. So we're going to talk about the key object-oriented abstractions in Java 8, which were also in Java 7, namely abstraction, inheritance, and polymorphism. And these are really at the core of what it means to be a, an object-oriented language. So again, Java was designed to be object-oriented. As a consequence, the way you organized the Java app was in terms of various structural elements. And these included key things like classes, and interfaces, and packages. And undoubtedly, you know a lot of this stuff already. So hopefully, this will be review. So an object is an instance of a class, right? So the way to think about it is like the class is kind of like the cookie cutter. And an object is like a cookie, right? You make the cookie out of the cookie cutter. And the class, which is really the key thing, I don't know why they call it object-oriented programming. It should be called class-oriented programming, because that's the key concept. It's basically a blueprint that describes how to make things. And it has operations and state. And it is used to interact with other objects. So here's a very simple example called simple set. The objects reside in the memory location of a computer. If you take a look at simple set, this is one of the examples we have here. Uh, we basically show how to make a simple set. And you have some state, which are the fields, like the element data and the size and so on. We have some behavior, which are represented by methods like add, contains, and so on. And these are just the ways in which you interact with a class. So I'm pretty much sure you know all the stuff I'm saying here. Objects often, though not always, correspond to real world things. Right? That's kind of the appeal of an object-oriented approach. It's about modeling the real world. So if we were developing some kind of accounting software or banking software, we'd have an account object. And it would have you know, various things that would be <clears throat> fields, like the current balance of the money, and whether or not you've got overdraft protection set up. And then you'd have operations to add and withdraw and check the balance. Right? So again, pretty obvious. Now, what, what it constitutes a real world depends on your perspective. So if you're doing banking, that's, that's pretty clearly real world. But this is a virtual representation of a real world thing. Some of the stuff we'll do is, is less real world. right? Some of the things are very virtual and, and stuff that's in the realm of computer science, like collections. right? So a hash tree or something like that, or a hash uh, map or a hash set. That's not really real world. It's an abstraction in computing. But it still has the same concept of state and operations. There's a whole pile of non-object-oriented programming languages, which mercifully have sort of gone away. Um, examples being you know, Fortran, C, Ada, and so on. And the way that they specify their <coughs> structure is through functional elements, like actions and logic, right? So back in the day, back when I was first learning programming, when we would learn how to program, we would have to draw these ridiculous data flow diagrams to show what our program did before we wrote the code, which I always thought was horrible. It took way longer for me to write the stupid diagram than to write the code. But the idea was to get people to think more systematically. So that's kind of functional oriented, right? You've got uh, conditional branching, yes or no. You've got straight line code. You've got iteration and all this kind of stuff. And you could visualize it. Object oriented programs also have action and logic. It's like, don't think it's all about structure, right? So we've got a whole pile of methods. But in a classic object-oriented Java program, and by the way, it's almost impossible in classic Java to do anything other than object-oriented programs, because there's no functions that sit by themselves, uh, these functional elements do not constitute the primary way of structuring your program. That's not the main focus of an object-oriented program. It's about classes and interfaces and packages and inheritance relationships and so on. Ironically, this is kind of weird. It just shows how. The world goes full circle. Java 8 adds a whole pile of functional stuff back into Java. So it's kind of ironic, because 
object-oriented languages like C++ and Java were designed to get away from function-based thinking and so-called algorithmic design. <clears throat> that was in vogue for a good 20 years. And now this stuff is back again, right? It's, it's kind of weird. But we'll see when we look at this more carefully, this is why Java 8's a hybrid language. It allows you to combine the function-oriented parts under the context or within the umbrella of object-oriented structure. And I really like that, and I'll talk more about that later. Don't worry too much about that now, but that's really important. So there are three main object-oriented concepts. Abstraction, of which there's data and control abstraction. Inheritance, which is about subclassing and taking along the properties and methods of things you inherit from, much like the way we inherit traits from our, our parents and our ancestors. And polymorphism, which is a funky name, which really deals with many different implementations of the same interface and the ability to de decide at runtime what gets dispatched. Out of curiosity, <clears throat> I'm going to go through this stuff very quickly, so if you don't know it, it's fine. How many people here have programmed a lot with polymorphism? OK, so a handful. Um, what's interesting is that we don't really cover it a lot in 101. I think you might get a little teeny weeny bit of it towards the very end, but that's not really the focus of the class. So we're going to do a little tiny bit of that in this class just because it's important to understand it, but it's really not the focus a whole lot anymore of what Java 8 is all about. But I want you to be aware of it because it's useful to know. There are lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of other object-oriented programs, uh, programming languages. So Python, Objective-C, C Sharp, Swift, C++, and so on. Java has been the most popular language for a while, although every once in a while people start you know, kind of coming up and trying to steal its thunder, but it's still very popular. Um, these are arguably the most popular OO languages today. So C Java, C++, C Sharp, and Python, arguably. You could make a case for some other things, but that's probably what you'd find. Once you know one object-oriented language, it's really easy to learn another one. So once you know C++, learning Java is not too hard. It's actually somewhat deceptive because there's common syntax, but the semantics are a bit different. But it's something you can do in a very short time, like a couple of weeks. You can become you know, passably fluent. You won't become a guru with it. That takes longer, but it's not too hard to learn. Some of you may already know Java really well, so some of this stuff may be a bit boring to you. Um, we're going to move through it quickly. However, Make sure that you ask questions if you have them or come to office hours or post them on Piazza because you're going to have to know this for, certainly for assignment 1A, if not other stuff, right? So you're going to have to, we're going to build on these things and I'll expect you to have a pretty good understanding of how it all works. All right, so that's the, the end of the overview.